Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? My name is Dan Emery, bass player and vocalist in Thetan. And Dan, you've been on the podcast before. The last time you were on was yes. in 2020 before the release of your album, Space Cortex, which was a collaboration with Cool Keith. Yes. Back then, you referred to your music as ugly hardcore, I believe. Is that still true? <laughs> yes. I feel it is. I feel it is. But the songs are a little bit longer on on the newer stuff. And and there's some some pretty sections uh, this time around as well, right? There are. I think I think they are at least. So do you want to modify ugly hardcore? Like maybe ugly hardcore. Ugly hardcore with, uh... with pretty tendencies. <laughs> is it ugly hardcore that's beautiful on the inside? Yes. <laughs> that is <laughs> that is a perfect explanation. Perfect description. And and we'll talk about some of some of that stuff and some of the collaborators that you had this time around. Um back to Space Gore-Tex. You know, that was that was such a wild album. Uh you collaborated with Cool Keith. Um, and not just Cool Keith, but members of Guar and the Dwarves uh popped up on the album as well. Um yes. and yes. people should should go and, and check that out. And they should also also check out the the podcasts that we did together. Because we talked about Absolutely. you know how the whole thing came together and the history of Thaden and stuff like that. Um, I'm curious. Three years later, uh, you know, what was the response to that album? Did it open you up to to a new audience? Did Cool Keith's um, fans track you guys down and wonder what the hell all your older albums were about? Maybe not as much as I would have uh, would have liked for them to. Um, I think that we approached that album in a way that didn't really. Uh, it didn't leave a too much of a a breadcrumb trail back to the the heavier stuff. It was for for what it's worth a hip hop album for a hip hop hip hop album's sake. Um, so I'd say unless people were already into the type of music that we do, they probably didn't really care too much for what we do. <laughs> I don't I don't think we converted anybody to to ugly hardcore fans. <laughs> And, maybe, as maybe. As, and as far as your own audience, what was the response? Bewilderment. People were very <laughs> surprised. I mean, bewildered in a good way, or yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it took a little. Uh, I think it took people off guard, which was very much the intention. We wanted to kind of surprise people with something that uh, I feel is awesome but probably not something that's done very often and you've you've collaborated with a few more hip-hop artists uh uh since then uh, including somebody who yes. pops up on on this latest album uh were you a big hip-hop head growing up were you a big fan yeah absolutely um but just like i guess m more than just hip-hop like I, I was into just music that was left of center a little bit so the hip-hop that, that i listen to and the people that pop up on our albums are definitely stylistically not quite conventional um and that's a good thing that's it that's a good thing because that opens up doors for uh for experimentation which i think is important with what we do yeah uh, I don't listen to a lot of hip hop and I definitely don't listen to a lot of modern hip hop. Um, I, I do like old eighties hip hop, especially, you know, yeah. the, um, the old New York stuff, just because of the inventiveness, you know, a, a yeah. lot of, um, uh, you know, just the limitations of, of what, um, of what the artist had to work with led to some really creative solutions in terms of, you know, sampling and, um you know just just the way that they approached songwriting i think was was very yeah. interesting just using a turntable in general was just it, it was owning a limitation and turning it into something that you can open a whole new dimension from yeah i mean i, I grew up in the 90s and so industrial rock was was really popular and you know 
the history of industrial rock was bands that um you know guys like genesis porridge and throbbing gristle who who wanted mm -hmm. to figure out like what what industrial what music would mean in this new industrial society and i think of you know like you know living in a in a big industrialized city where space is limited and everyone's packed closely together and you don't really have you know i think the band is is becoming an, an outmoded concept an outdated concept i think uh bands are maybe on their way out in terms of what young people are are um are looking at doing in terms of creating music but you know hip-hop definitely like, not a necessity <laughs> yeah um and, and just in terms not. of like having space to like you know store equipment and you know having a being able to find a place to practice i, I think it's yeah it's 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 hard in a in a city but hip-hop i mean all you really need is like one guy to provide beats or beatbox, one guy mm -hmm. to rap, and then you know a third guy to like point at the clock on his chest and go, "Yeah, boy." <laughs> if only people had hype men like they used to these days, that would be. I think that would be cool. I mean, there's there's some some hype men, but it's they, I don't think they take front and center like uh like they did in the early days. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there a position open in Thaden for hype men? Do you need a guy who will like dance on stage with you guys, like the, I mean, the Blue Mondays? There's only two of us in the band. We have plenty of space being unused on on the stage, so <laughs> you know we could probably get away with maybe two or three hype men. And you know, we we spoke about uh, uh, why there's only two of you in this band. Um, yes. Uh, in terms of of the other instruments that you play on this album um do, uh is there ever a concern about how you're going to pull that off live um so there's the only the only thing is there's an interlude on the album the only thing that would, would make me feel that way is there's an interlude on the album where i'm playing a mountain dulcimer and it's a track that we uh recorded it it's recorded outside it was recorded with a binaural microphone outside with a bunch of crickets and bugs and buzzing around and a helicopter flew over which was totally not planned out but of course that's something that's not going to be done live unless i decide to break out the dulcimer and sit down aside from that the other instruments that are on there it's primarily bass drum and theremin and we bring the theremin out to shows it's mostly just for atmospheric filler but okay it works yeah and as far as the the mountain dulcimer that you recorded uh you recorded outside but you have your own studio right yes uh why why did you do why did you decide to record this outside um around the same time that we released the space gore-tex album i started recording a series of uh of outdoor folk artist recordings where they would come and we would run lines out to the magnolia tree behind the the house and people would just set up in the dark it was summertime so the crickets and cicadas were very loud and we would record them out there like that and the series of recordings actually did really well um i still do some not as much as i had done of those recordings i was releasing them in 2020 and 2021 every month and some of them even were on the billboard charts um they did some of them did really well um and and it was kind of i guess a way to link that project to something different um kind of bridge the gap between two things that i do um with my especially recording production and mastering and what have you um i wanted to bridge the gap i wanted to make it to where people if they're if they search hard enough they'll find my name in a few different things and they'll be able to make connections right. that sounds egotistical to say if people search my nobody's gonna search my name but <laughs> still it, it it was it was an attempt to bridge the gap between things that i do gotcha so besides the the new album you also put out an ep this this year 
which had covers. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about the, the EP. So the EP came about around the tail end of when getting vinyl manufactured was taking an extraordinarily long time. So we finished the album and we felt that it was going to take a very long time to get the, the records pressed, which isn't really the case now. So we decided that if we're going to sit around waiting, then we might as well put something out in between. And there's, so we had some songs that we, uh, we had one song that we recorded for the album that just, we didn't put it on the album. It's a good song, but as far as like the length of the album, it just, we, we wanted to keep it off. And so we put that song towards the EP. Um, there's a few cover songs, a couple cover songs that we wanted to do that didn't really make sense to record for an album. And then there was a couple older songs that we've just felt we still play them, and but we felt that the recordings from the original that they were on just didn't hold up. So we kind of threw together some stuff of some songs that we were playing and at the time. We still play. And yeah. And, and also we just, we didn't have any CDs out with the exception of the CD format of Space Gore-Tex. None of our stuff had ever been released on CDs. We've done a lot of vinyl and cassette releases, but we didn't have anything that people who buy CDs could get. Um, so it was a good opportunity to take a lot of those old recording splits that are gone out of print. Um, you know, just random recording stuff that got left off albums and put that on the CD. So the, the EP itself in the digital world is only five or six songs, but the CD format has 45 songs. Oh, well, <laughs> bang for throwback. your buck. <laughs> Throw back to the old, uh, power violence and, and grindcore albums that, ha that would have. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I would be lying if I said that I didn't, look at those releases and model this completely after that i mean i it that that's that's the era that i got into hardcore during so it it deserves to be recognized i guess at least in what i'm doing yeah so you you went into the release of the ep knowing that you would have an album coming out shortly yes. after yeah uh i mean in terms of the writing for the album did you have a sense of what what you wanted this album to be and how how you wanted to you wanted it to be different from what you've done previously yeah um so we started writing a lot of the material on this album during the the period of time that we couldn't play shows during 2020 and 2021 um we weren't really in a big hurry to put it out, especially during those uncertain times, because if we, we didn't know how long that was going to last. Um, so we wrote and we wrote 10 songs. Well, we wrote uh, we wrote 11 songs, but 10 of them ended up on the album. And then the entire B side of the record is um, more. I guess exploration for us, sonic exploration. Does that sound pretentious to say that? That sounds like it would be a pretentious term. Was sonic exploration like sounds too smart for what we're doing? <laughs> um, well, it is. It is we, a bit uh, of a de departure from what people would expect from you. And I say this, you know, yeah. knowing that you also did a collaboration with Cool Keith. This is true. This is true. Got to keep them guessing. But um, yeah, we we wanted to, I guess, spread out a little bit on these songs. Um, I, I didn't want to make, I, I didn't, and, and I say I, but it, it's definitely a, a two-person thing. And we both have to come at these decisions from the same perspective. Chad and I both agreed that we didn't want to just recreate abysmal which was the album that came out in 2019 we didn't want to just do that album again and be like here's another you know 18 songs that are fast and 
abrasive. I mean, we could do that. Sure, it's fun, but it gets old. Do songs start with you and Chad together in the rehearsal space? Yes, that's very rare that I ever come up with a riff outside of the rehearsal space. However, on this album, there's a couple parts to a couple songs where I had ideas for what I wanted to play and then presented them. And then we go through the, the I guess, the we, we run it through the gauntlet and change things, make things better, throw things out. Um, we beat the songs up for a while before we sign off on them and call them finished. But, yeah. Um, it's... It's a 50-50 thing with the songwriting. Yeah. I usually have like a concept for what I want a song to do dynamically before I know what note I'm playing it. So I'll be like, all right, I want the next part of the song to kind of take a different turn and then we'll we'll work something out and then build on it. I'm terrible about remembering riffs until I've got a recording of them that I can listen to. So if we didn't have uh, a, a recorder, just a small little uh, two-track recorder in our practice space, we'd probably only have like four songs complete <laughs> ever. Um, I can't remember the stuff that, that we make up at practice for more than that practice. <laughs> so we... Uh, We'll come back to it and we'll revisit things and we'll change things and then eventually we'll we'll think it sounds good enough to share it. So the new Thetan album is called Grand Ole Agony and it will be released yes. on October 13th through Dan's own label, which is called Anti-Corporate Music. Yes. So we, cool. you know, so we spoke about how uh, how the album is is a little bit different from previous albums. Um, let's start with let's start with the collaborators. Who do you have coming okay. on board this time? So at the very beginning of the album, there is a monologue from Crunchy Black of Three Six Mafia, who is a group that I have loved since I was in high school. And if anybody's listened to the Space Gore-Tex album, then they'll know that Gangsta Boo from 3-6 Mafia was on that album. So it was kind of a continuation of that little relationship there. Um, Oscar there winners 3-6 Tennessee... Mafia, right? What's that? Oscar winners 3-6 Mafia, right? Yes. Yes, they are. They are. Um, and they're they're a Tennessee group and we're a Tennessee group. So it's it's just nice to <clears throat> it's nice to collaborate with people who are from the same region as you. Though I don't think that we're anywhere near on their level. They're uh <laughs> they're they're miles <laughs> ahead of us <laughs> in every aspect of art and music gotcha why why um, crunchy black what why did uh, uh, why was he somebody you wanted to to lead off the album with i think that i think that his style and and how he approaches his his songs and his verses is probably it probably carries similar energy to what we do. It's he, he's got a very aggressive and at times unhinged ener energy to his his stuff, right. and I think that 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 it, it was a good. Uh, I can't think of a uh, of a proper word to use to describe it. I think that it um, it was a good relationship. Yeah, and maybe a, a way of, of telling people that this is going to be different from, you know, another hardcore album or another power violence album, right? Yes, but then we go into the most traditional power violence song on the record <laughs> <laughs> immediately. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, was that also intentional? Um, kind of, but not really that uh, that focused of an intention. We just wanted to start the album off with a banger and something that people who have heard us in the past will not be too surprised by. I didn't want to. I didn't want to throw something on there and you know people think that it was the wrong record that they were listening to yeah so we decided to to begin with something that that seems normal and some of the the people that you've had on the the magnolia uh the magnolia sessions uh uh contributed to the album as well right yes uh we had Ashley May and Benjamin Todd of Lost Dog Street Band on the record. Ashley was also on the Space Gore-Tex album, and she is a fantastic violin player. Um, she contributed to two songs, and one of them being that very, very different song on the B-side of the record. And Benjamin contributed harmonica which seems like a very odd thing to say that we have on one of our albums a harmonica but i think it works it it fits the vibe of the part that it's on and a mutual friend of ours also uh uh does something on the album as well right yes yes Dave Brenner from Grid Failure does uh a lot of the a lot of the I'd say he sets the tone for the entire B side of the record. His his approach to to making music and sounds was exactly what I felt that we needed for that song because it just made a, there, there's a lot of pretty stuff that we're trying to put on that song and it needs to be balanced out with stuff that's not pretty in a way where it can be cohesive and all work together and i'm trying to say this in a way where i'm not giving away too much because i do want people to actually have to listen to it to hear what i'm talking about and not just take my word for it but take my word for it he does awesome stuff and uh yes he definitely set the tone for that that whole B side. So, what, what was the process of of composing the song? Did you and Chad? That one. Yeah. Okay, so that one. Um, we had finished recording. I think a lot of the drum tracks for the album, and I, I don't think we were completely finished yet. I think we were just taking a break. And we just needed to clear our heads and do some something completely different. And so the first half of the song, well, it's in three, the song is in three parts. So the first third of the song, um, I just started playing a riff and he started playing along to it. And we just kind of, kind of goofed around with that riff for a while and built it up and tore it down. And that, that riff came together really quickly. And so we recorded it while we were uh while we were still set up to record the rest of the album we just recorded that so we could just just so we could play around with something when we first started making that track we really didn't have much of an intention for it it wasn't something that we were like we've got to do this thing for the album we were perfectly content with it just being the songs that we had written originally um and then you know, we, we had some extra stuff that we want to play with. That's usually how we go about writing the instrumentals for hip hop collaborations that we do. And we've done a few of them since the, the cool Keith album. We'll, we'll just mess around. I'll make up a riff and Chad will start playing drums and we'll take what we get from that and then see what works out of it. Um, and I think we did uh, the second portion of that or the 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 ending portion of that song in a similar way it was just we were taking a break and we decided to come up with some stuff the middle part of that song was actually more it was more dave than than anyone else um 
I just I, I sent him the stuff that we were working on and I told him that we wanted to bridge those two parts together and for him to just come up with something. And he and Matt Gallahan came up with a lot of really cool stuff. And me and Chad just kind of worked around that. So that song came together in a very strange way. It was more of a a collaborative thing than it was just a, a Thetan song. Did a lot of the, uh, the arranging come together at the production stage while you're mixing? Um, no, no. Cause once the idea really started to come together, it, it became sort of a obsession for a couple weeks, just as you know, until I could get everybody who I wanted involved to, to come in and do their parts. Um, but yeah, it was that was coming together way before we even started mixing. Um, hell, that was coming that had come together probably before half the lyrics were written. Um, it was just uh, it was something that I got really excited about, and it became I think I spent more time working on that for a period of time than the rest of the album. You know, I, I already knew what I wanted to do to get the rest of the album to sound the way it needed to sound. But that became something where I was very excited and spent a lot of energy on that. I don't think it would have worked had it not been for the, the people that came on with us. Um, Leslie Fox Humphreys is one person that I definitely want to give a huge shout out to. She played the cello on that song and fucking made it like like that really between her and and dave that really set the entire vibe of that song into motion i don't think it would have got used had the two of them not contributed their parts to it in the way that they did i mean even with all the the pre-planning and uh you know your involvement with the uh, the recording and and the mixing, uh, the production side of it. Was there anything about the song that surprised you? The way it turned out, that it worked. <laughs> really, <laughs> um, I, I I approached it fully expecting it to be something that we just never used or that we never used in full. Um, but it the it just kept it kept growing and it kept evolving in a way that i at no point listened to it and had to say this isn't happening right like it just kept going in the right direction which is kind of rare i think um it's very common for me to start working on something and then just have to stop and go back 20 steps and start over again uh but that one did not that just that worked um so that was surprising um and i think i can't think of a way that that track could have been done any different that i would have uh liked it more so as we mentioned the album was recorded in your own studio which yes. people watching the video can see uh, you're sitting in right now black matter yes. mastering yes has has your approach to Recording Thaden uh, changed over the years? Yes, it, it has. My, my approach to recording in general has mainly, as you can see by the name of the studio, it's mostly for, uh, for all intents and purposes, a mastering studio. 90% of what I do is, is just post-production. Um, I still have my console and I still have my recording equipment. I still have all my microphones. I never got rid of those. So, but I, I've scaled back on on recording, and that's a good thing. I think that itself, that that move itself, has really changed the way I record because it's not an everyday thing for me anymore. Where it once was, you know, I was doing five six sessions a week, and it became formulaic. Uh, I don't do it as much, so I take more time to experiment and just 
do things wrong to see how it sounds and see how I like it. And, and surprisingly enough, a lot of the time when I do things wrong, I like it better. Um, <laughs> it has more of a natural sound than the traditional recording style. So over the years, I think just taking a break from being constantly in that position has forced me to look at things in a different perspective. And I feel that uh, as a result, it sounds the the recordings sound end up sounding less, less normal, less, I guess, uh, well, th there's a sense of normal to them. They it doesn't sound like a like a not a punk band, but it's I don't know. It's hard to describe. <laughs> it's not formulaic to me. Yeah. Do you and Chad track live? Uh, we do sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, okay. and sometimes we we break it all the way down. But most of the time, we track live. The 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 most common way that we track is uh, I'll have a split signal, and so we'll record the drums, the the low bass, one of the high bass cabs, and then I'll come back and record another high bass cab over it. On this album, however, I didn't do that approach. This one we stripped it down completely and recorded the drums. And then I came back and treated it like it was a... I, I treated it like there was more than one person playing bass. Okay, gotcha. Uh, why? Out of curiosity. I mean, th there is a song, I think I, it's the, th the third song on the album, where it almost sounds like a, a guitar. And so I'm assuming that's what you mean by like having a... Is that the one that starts with the arpeggiated part? It, it's kind and of it's like a doomy... Like doomy sludgy kind of riff at the beginning okay i think i know which one you're talking about um the we we took a different approach on this one because in our live show i'm playing two instruments and doing vocals at the same time and i'm also controlling feedback and other things so it's like i'm doing a lot for one person during one moment and we've done that live and we've done that in recording as well um this time i wanted to have control over every aspect of what i was trying to what i was trying to do so that if i didn't like something i would have the luxury of going back and changing it <laughs> right yeah, yeah yeah which is impossible to do when you track uh two people playing at the same time right yeah uh out of curiosity when you say sometimes you record things wrong what does that mean um for instance sometimes uh i just like to let me let me try to find a really good example um Throwing out convention is, uh, I guess, uh, a hard thing to explain unless people have history with recording or if they're. But in punk and DIY music, people have a tendency to do that, to do their own recordings often. Um, recording things wrong, I would say, I, I like to switch up things like, uh, for instance, use different mics that i normally wouldn't use on uh on the drums use uh use drum mics on instrument cabs um which i guess isn't really so abnormal when you think about what you're doing um that's a hard question to answer <laughs> um because um, yeah, that's a hard question to answer when not in the moment of actually doing it. Um, yeah, but it, it sounds it sounds like it's more on the gear side. Like you know, yeah. there's a convention yeah. for, for how to record certain things, and uh, you go against that 
from time to time. Absolutely. Uh, like, for instance, sometimes I'll just run a direct line of something. Um, I'll run my base through a direct line, which I absolutely hate direct lines live. Um, and then just use that and blow it completely out, make it sound just disgusting and ugly and completely like feedback, and then run that through. Um, other times I'll record stuff and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll let feedback, I'll just have a feedback track just running. Like I'll loop a feedback track and just let it run through an entire song. Um, things like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. You record at your own studio and you release music through your own label. I, yes. I'm curious, is this just uh, a matter of practicality or do you feel, uh, do you feel you really want control of, of every aspect of how your music is, is recorded and released? I guess that depends on what day you ask me that question. <laughs> um, uh, I, I I guess I've had to come to terms with the fact that I do have some control issues when it comes to letting other people make decisions for me or make decisions on my behalf. Um, for instance, I've had a very, very, very difficult time letting other people record my bands. Um, just because when we get into everything, I have a tendency to hover and say what i think should happen and then i end up taking over and it becomes a fucking fiasco um <laughs> in terms of the record label it started out mainly just as an outlet because i didn't have expectations of anybody else wanting to contribute financially to the stuff that me and my friends were doing so i was like well fuck it we'll do it ourselves and over the years it just kind of kept going um i've tried to kill the label off at least three or four separate times and for some reason or another i find myself still putting shit out um <laughs> but it is also a very convenient thing to be able to say we want to do whatever release we want to do and nobody can tell us how to do it nobody can tell us we can't do it um a very unfortunate thing in the music industry and maybe not so much in like diy punk but maybe on the bigger labels i'm not sure about their inner workings but bands have um rules that they have to follow they're not allowed to do a project that they might really be excited about doing because it's not conducive to the the label profiting they're not able to they're not allowed to play certain shows because uh you know some somebody from the label might say well you can't play that show or whatever i've heard i've heard stories of that at least i'm not going to name names but if uh if any record label people listen to this podcast and that fits your description well then i'm talking about you um <laughs> so <laughs> it, it just became not out of necessity but just out of the luxury of being able to make decisions that I felt worked best for, for my band. And as far as things like the Magnolia sessions, how do you pick the artists that you work with? A lot of the artists are suggested by other artists. So the first one that I recorded was actually a close friend of mine and it was some of his first recordings that that he was doing playing acoustic music like he had played in metal bands and punk bands for years and i'd recorded and released a lot of his stuff over the years uh for a period of time he and i actually ran the label together and then his interests shifted sure. um and so we, i did that first one with him just uh just to see if it worked just to see how it sounded because i didn't really again with that i didn't have any big plans to do something major i just wanted to waste time during a period of time where there was really not much to do um and it came out really good and i talked to some other people that i was working with at the time and a couple of the other acoustic artists that i was working with at the time and they seemed excited about it and then from that other people who they were friends with would find out and reach out or you know the artist would tell me you need to record this guy or 
you know, this band is really cool. It would sound really awesome if they had one. So it, it became a very organic thing. The decision making process kind of makes itself. I don't really go out seeking certain artists. It just kind of happens naturally. If if you put the label down, uh, would you be looking for someone else to release Thaden's music or would Thaden also? Probably. I mean, it, if that were an option, I would always consider it. Even if it were an option today, I would consider it depending on the circumstances. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 41. Uh, I have a business that I run. Dad is 41 and he has his career. So, I mean, we have our lives. I can't, uh, I can't take any offers from a label that might have demands that I can't fulfill. Um, you know, for instance, if a, if a label were interested and they were like, yeah, but you have to tour, you know, four, five months straight. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. That sounds miserable to me. So that just wouldn't work out. Um, so I guess in that respect, releasing stuff myself is practical, but I'm, I'm always open to consider different options. Gotcha. So by the time people hear this podcast, Grand Ole Agony will be out through anti-corporate music. Dan, how can people order the album? What's the best way to get it? Best way to get it, you could find it at anticorpmusic.com. That is the web store for the label. Um, right now, we are going to be doing vinyl and digital. CDs will eventually come out, but we're not going to do CDs just yet. Probably soon, eventually. Um, as far as digital is concerned, you can... Uh, you can find our Bandcamp page at thetan.bandcamp.com. And then if you just want to stream it somewhere, I guess that's fine too. It'll be everywhere. It'll it'll be on all the streaming platforms. So tell me about the vinyl release. What is what is an animated etched LP? So the outer edge, and this was actually on the last LP that we did, not the not the Cool Keep collaboration, but the last punk record that we did abysmal um the outer edges of the record have etchings on them which is something that i do here um and it's uh, a sequence of images that are etched around the outer edge of the record and if you look at it through the through your your camera on your phone the shutter speed on the camera will cause it to actually play an image <laughs> so kind of like a flipbook but, kind of thing yeah yeah cool and is there two different versions or is it just the the etched version it's just the etched version the etching is only on the b-side because the b-side had uh enough space for that the a-side is a little bit longer than the b-side gotcha and if people want to follow Thetan and anti-corporate music online, what's the best way to do that? If you were to look up anti-corp music on either Facebook or Instagram and possibly, I think, even Twitter or X or whatever the fuck it's called these days, um, <laughs> you can find it there. <laughs> it's anti-corp music all run together. Uh, Thetan, if you looked up Thetan underscore hc for hardcore on instagram and i think it's also the same on facebook um our facebook like a year ago just about a year ago got uh and this was on both the band and the the label the facebook pages got taken over by hackers so we lost pretty much everything on those pages so follow those so i can feel better about them existing in the first place because the energy to stay on facebook and post compelling fun things is pretty fucking low these days <laughs> yeah i, I was gonna, actually going to ask you if, if you if you've been getting a lot of weird web traffic because 
when I put up our our previous uh, conversation, I was getting a lot of web traffic that was completely out of proportion to a the rest of uh, the podcast and b the the actual audio streams. You know what I mean? Um, uh-huh. And so it, I I started wondering if you know maybe a certain uh, religious organization was sending bots to uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know not that i know of um and the way that everything worked out last year i think it was just people stealing pages and trying to sell them uh i went down a very deep rabbit hole trying to figure out what the hell was going on and all sources seemed to indicate that it was just some people trying to sell uh people's facebook pages and instagram gotcha okay well hopefully that'll that'll get resolved soon uh yeah. tours live shows yeah, do you guys have <laughs> <laughs> or you know social media could completely implode in in the next six wouldn't that be nice <laughs> <laughs> well that would be a good day i mean maybe every, everyone sure would just a lot put of down businesses their phones would and probably go suffer outside. yeah yeah, everybody would just take a, a deep breath, walk outside, hear a bird chirp, and be like, what the fuck have I been doing for the past 15 years? Uh, do you guys have any any shows or any tours lined up? We've got some sporadic shows coming up, uh, mostly in the region around, uh, around Nashville and the surrounding areas. We've got some... Uh, Let's see, we're playing actually all of the shows that I, I'm about to say will probably be over with by the time this airs. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're active. We we stay active and we uh primarily if we aren't touring, we are active regionally and we do occasionally venture out beyond our comfort zone and tour from time to time. But there's no tour booked right now. Okay. So You've been very generous with your time for the the second second time in a row, but well, thank is you. there anything else you want to say? On the spot, no. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs>